Hey gang, we are back with The Bronze Bow, chapter three. And you're gonna hear some background noise because we're all getting ready to go on a big school retreat. <clears throat> so, here we go, chapter three. Under the midday sun, the rock would blister one's fingers. The air over the smelting oven, oven quivered. When Daniel bent over it to poke at the doughy mass of red hot ore, the fumes scorched his nostrils. He glanced at Samson, who for a full half day had been kneading the bellows without ceasing. Perhaps Samson, where he had lived, had learned early to endure the heat of the sun. Daniel had had enough for this day. <clears throat> the small lump of iron could be left now till it had cooled enough to be broken into pieces. He picked up a goatskin bag, tipped it up, and let the warm water run down his throat and splash over his chin and chest. Then he handed the bag to Samson. After almost four weeks in the camp, Samson still never helped himself to anything. Okay, so this from, the, from chapter two, we're jumping ahead four weeks. Daniel had to have it forever on his mind that the man might be hungry or thirsty. Now watching the water sloshing out carelessly, he reminded himself that the man had earned it. They had twice as much water in the camp now that Samson helped to haul it from the spring. Had the big man any idea that he was free? He seldom made a move without an order for Daniel. Rosh had given him up in disgust. Rosh was used to seeing men jump when he gave an order, but no matter how he shouted and cursed at Samson, the giant stood immovable. Baffled, not sure whether Samson was utterly stupid or only defiant, Rosh had shrugged the man off to Daniel. All day long, the giant was at the boy's heels, and at night he slept so close that Daniel could barely stretch his legs without kicking him. It was like being chained to a huge rock, having to drag it with him wherever he went. Daniel had to admit that his work was easier. There was never a lack of firewood, and with Samson to help with the bellows instead of the skinny 12-year-old jock tan, so keep that in mind, remember that 12-year-old that like scurried before the caravan came and sort of like hid? Well, he, his name is Jock Tan, J-O-K-T-A-N. He could keep a steady heat in the furnace. The other men were grateful for Samson's muscles too. They came to Daniel as though they were asking to borrow a hammer or an ax. A boulder that five of them were heaving and tugging, Samson could roll into place like a child's pebble. The whole eastern end of the camp had been fortified in the last two weeks. Even Rosh had to admit that Samson earned his keep. But the men still hated and feared him and made him the butt of all their jokes. That was one more reason for Daniel to resent his burden. He felt more than ever shut out from the rest, for the jibes that were aimed at Samson usually included him as well. Was Samson actually deaf? Sometimes he suspected the man understood a great deal more than they realized, and once he had made the mistake of saying so. The only result had been that the men had plagued Samson cruelly, devising all sorts of text, tests to trick him. <clears throat> they had finally tired of trying to surprise a reaction out of Samson, but they had not convinced Daniel. Was Samson dumb? Were the sounds he occasionally made just gibberish? Or were they fragments of a language it was useless to speak? Where had he come from? What thoughts went on behind that impassive face? What memories were locked inside where they could never be shared? At times, Daniel hated him with a dull resentment at other time, with a dull resentment. At other times, like now, as Samson set down the water skin, wiped a huge hand across his mouth and looked at Daniel with a slow, childish grin spreading across his face, Daniel felt a grudging liking. He helped himself and Samson from the stock of raw vegetables in the cave, cabbage and cucumbers and onions pilfered from the farms in the valley, and they lay down in the dark shade of the cave to doze away the midday hours. He was roused by Rosh's voice shouting his name. 
He came out of the cave, still half asleep, blinking in the sunlight. Ebel, the sentry, had come into camp leading a man who was tied and blindfolded, as Rosh ordered all strangers and prisoners must be. Come out here, Daniel, Rosh barked. This fellow claims he was looking for you. Ever see him before? Daniel came near, staring at the young, dark bearded stranger. Unhampered by blindfold or thongs, the man stood in the center of the suspicious ring of outlaws with the easy confidence of one who had nothing to hide. Is this Daniel? He spoke in a deep voice. Peace be with you, my friend. It's been a long time. Daniel came closer. Simon? He asked uncertainly. He could scarcely associate his memory of a tattered apprentice with this tall, vigorous man. Joel gave you my message. I was glad to get it. You'd be surprised how often I've wondered what happened to you. So you know him? Rosh was puzzled, but he singled for the man but he signaled for the man to be released. The boy's been well taken care of, he said affably. You can't deny that. The blindfold removed, Simon looked Daniel over with a twinkle of amusement that the boy was taller than he. He's grown, that's certain, he allowed. I wouldn't have expected so much muscle. <clears throat> that's from the forge, said Daniel flattered. Did Joel tell you I've kept at my trade? I'll show you. Later, said Simon. First, I'd like some water if you have some. You people give a man a warm welcome up here. Chagrined, Daniel hastened to find the coolest water in the back of the cave. Rosh left them, and other men, and the other men made, men made a show of some business well with an earshot. Daniel was clumsy with pleasure and importance. Never before had anything like this happened to him. How did you know where to find me? He asked. I had an idea that once I got up the mountain, I'd have plenty of assistance. You might have got hurt instead. I don't think so, said Simon. He seemed very sure of himself. Proudly, Daniel showed Simon his forge. He knew he had reason to be proud of it, but it was gratifying to see Simon's surprise. He had discovered in his first year on the mountain patches where the soil was rusty with iron. Gradually, he had learned to smell it, constructing an oven against a rocky wall, lining it with clay, and devising a primitive sort of bellows from the pair of goat skins. This is very good, said Simon, poking at the lump of ore that lay cooling in the ashes. No wonder you have muscles. Samson helps me, said Daniel, pointing toward the big man who crouched near the mouth of the cave. Simon started. Beard of Moses, where did you get that giant? He escaped from a caravan, said Daniel. We don't know where he came from. Hmm. With a long look at Samson, Simon turned back to the blade Daniel had put in his hand, running an expert finger along its edge. Not bad. Not bad at all. Amalek taught you well. Do you make anything besides daggers and swords? Daniel hesitated. Hook sometimes. We don't have horses and we're not farmers. I see. Simon sat down on the flat stone, his back to the curious eye. Are you happy here, Daniel? Rosh is good to me, Daniel answered. Nothing like old Amalek. Amalek. You always wanted to fight the Romans, didn't you? So did you, said Daniel. Joel told me that you are called Simon the Zealot. You ought to know, Rosh. If, he, if you knew him, you'd join him too. A sudden hope sprang up in him. Is that why you came today? Simon shook his head. I've known about Rosh for a long time, he said. I am a zealot, yes, and I work for the same end, but we don't exactly see eye to eye. If you really knew him, perhaps, today I will... Today, I came only to find you. Amalek died a fortnight ago, Daniel. You could come back to the village if you like. Old Amalek dead? Should he feel something? Pleasure? Remorse? Pity? It was too far away. He had not thought about going back for a long, long time. What about my bond, he asked. I had four more years to go. There's no one to hold you to it. He hadn't a relative to his name, nor a friend either, poor man. I doubt anyone would ever even remember. Daniel tried to imagine going back. He couldn't tell whether he would like it or not. Simon let him think for a moment. Don't you want to see your grandmother again and your sister? Daniel did not answer. 
He was ashamed to say that he did not want to see them, but it was true. They have worried about you just as I have, said Simon. If you go back with me, you need only to stay a day or two, or two just to let them see you are well. It would please them. Rosh might need me. Daniel felt upset and resentful as he had that day on the mountain top with Joel. What was there in the village for him but the old troubles that had ceased to bother him up here? In the end, however, he let Simon persuade him, Simon and his own curiosity. Rosh grumbled, but there was an irresistible confidence about Simon that Rosh admired. The difficulty came from the one Daniel had not reckoned with at all. As he and Simon walked to the edge of the clearing, a vast shape rose from the mouth of the cave and moved after him. Looking back, Daniel found Samson at his heels. <clears throat> go back, Samson, he ordered. I go alone this time. He called Jockton, and the, the red-haired boy jumped to answer. See that he gets his meals, he told the boy. Jockton shut his lips tight, looking stubborn and scared. He won't touch you, Daniel urged. Just for one day, Jock, I'll do your work for you when I get back. Jockton agreed sull sullenly. Anyone who tries any tricks will have to have me to reckon with, Daniel shot back over his shoulder. But when he and Simon started forward again, the big man moved behind them. No, shouted Daniel angry now. He waved his arms. The man stared at him without expression. Or was there an expression that Daniel did not want to see? You cannot follow me, the boy said. Wait, I'll be back. Then he turned and stamped down the trail behind Simon. At the first turn, he looked back. Samson stood at the top of the trail looking down. He did not move, and Daniel raised a hand briefly to him and went on. As they walked, Daniel tried again to persuade, persuade Simon. If you're a zealot, if you work for the same end as Rosh, why don't you join him? When the day comes, said Simon, when the one comes who will lead us, when we will all join together. In the meantime, as I said before, Rosh and I don't see eye to eye. For one thing, I prefer to earn my own bread and meat. The insult to Rosh was like a blow to Daniel. Doesn't a warrior earn his keep? He demanded hotly. Rosh would give his life for Israel. Why should the farmers begrudge him a few scraps? They owe, me, they owe him far more than what he takes. Perhaps so, said Simon mildly. I did not mean to anger you, my friend. There will, need, there will be need for warriors. But just now, there is always a need for a good blacksmith. Daniel subsided into scouring silence. They left the rocky trail and came out on the road to the green pasture land that sloped down the village. Presently, they reached a small ford that crossed a mountain stream, which ga gathered in pebbly hollow, richly overgrown with fern and clusters of rose, oleander, and purple iris. Simon stopped and studied the spot. This will do, I think, he said. He began to remove his head covering. Daniel watched, puzzled. We will have to bathe here, said Simon. When we reach the village, it will be too late. Too late? It will be sundown, and the Sabbath will have begun. Daniel reddened. How could he have kept track of the Sabbath? Had Simon guessed that in the cave one day was the same as another? Simon, not looking at him, was carefully holding his cloak and spreading it on a bush. To Daniel's eye, Simon had no need to bathe. Daniel looked down at his own arms, streaked with soot and sweat. If Simon had said another word or even looked up, he would have abandoned the whole visit. But after a moment, he stamped into the fern, stripped off his own filthy tunic, and splashed into the pool. The feel of the water, after weeks of measuring it by drops from a goat skin bag, was sharp pleasure. Daniel scooped up handfuls of sand and pebbles and scraped his hands and feet. Then he got down on his knees and plunged his whole head into the stream. He came up dripping to find Simon already dressed, sitting on the bank and smiling at him. This time he managed a sheepish grin in return. They reached the village just as the thin, clear note of the ram's horn sounded. The first call to the Sabbath, signaling the workers to leave the fields. Nothing had really changed in five years, except that it all looked much smaller than Daniel had remembered. The streets narrower and dirtier, the dooryard shabbier and more cluttered. There were a few new houses with fresh mud walls and thatch still green on the roofs. He tried to recall who lived in this house or that one. They passed the shop of Amalek, so crumbling and out of repair that no new occupant had attempted to restore it to use. 
They passed the deserted square and the well where four weary donkeys were being hastily watered. They entered a dark, narrow street at the end of which stood the small, remembered house, its clay walls dark and crumbling, its roof sagging. Here Simon halted. I will leave you, he said. You will do better to go in by yourself. Daniel looked at the house uneasily. How do I know they... They are expecting you. I told them you were coming. Daniel glared at him. What right had Simon to be so sure he would come? Simon smiled a brief encouragement and strode away. Daniel stood, resentful, overcome with panic, and as he hesitated, the door opened, <clears throat> and a very old woman stood in the threshold. How bent she was, and thin. Daniel? Could that quavering voice belong to his grandmother? Is that you, Daniel? Yes, grandmother, he stammered. Peace be with you. As he spoke, he heard the second call of the horn across the village. My boy, it is time you came home. Her eyes, pale and clouded, peered up into his face. Her hands clutched at him. At the door, he hesitated, and the strong habit of his childhood reaching out to him, scarcely aware of what he did, he touched his finger to the mezuzah, the little niche in the doorframe that contained the sacred verses of the Shema. Then he stepped over the threshold. The room seemed to be happy. I'm sorry, let me, re let me redo that. The room seemed to be empty. One smoking oil lamp hung from the rafters. On the mat beneath it, the supper dishes were set and the Sabbath lamp stood ready. He peered ab about him with dread. Come Leah, his grandmother said. You should not be working after the second call. Come and greet your brother. Then he saw the girl seated behind the loom in the corner the long golden hair flowing over her shoulders. He stood tongue-tied. He had remembered a little girl. She was almost a woman, and he realized that she was beautiful. Leah, his grandmother fussed again, it is Daniel, come home after all these years. He ran his tongue over his lips. Peace, Leah, he said. The girl raised her head from her work so that he caught a glimpse of the clear blue of her eyes. The fear in them struck like a sickness behind his ribs. Don't mind her, the old woman said. She will know you before long. Shame, Leah, get some water for your brother. Where are your manners? <clears throat> the girl did not move. Daniel waited, sick at heart. Leah, he stammered. Don't you know me? He pleaded with her. Don't you remember how you always brought me water when I came home to visit? She raised her head again. Slowly into the blue eyes, he watched recognition come. You really are Daniel? Her voice was faint and tremulous. You have been away so long. Please bring me water, Leah. Obediently, she moved from the loom to the earthen jar by the door and poured out water into a hollow bowl, every motion gentle and graceful. But the bowl she held out to him was shaking so that the water spilled over. He took it awkwardly and bent to wash his feet. What had he expected or hoped? It was just as it had been when he left five years ago. No, it was worse. His sister Leah was 15 years old and fear still looked out of her eyes. The last call of the horn was clearly announcing the start of the Sabbath. His grandmother lighted a wick from the lamp and held it to the Sabbath lamp. Speak the blessing, Daniel, she said. It is fitting the man should say it. He hesitated, then the words came faltering to his lips. Praise be thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by thy commandments and commanded us to kindle the Sabbath light. They sat on the hard dirt floor around the frayed mat, and once again his grandmother looked to him. Long ago, for the first months in the caves, he had repeated a blessing silently over his food. This he remembered well. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, who bringeth forth bread from the earth. There was certainly little to bless God for, a watery stew made of lentils, some coarse barley bread. In a moment he noticed that the others were not eating at all, only watching him, their eyes following each morsel from the bowl to his mouth. Do you not eat with me? he asked. We have eaten already, said his grandmother, but Leah was more honest. Grandmother said we must save it for you, she explained in her sweet childish voice. She said you would be very hungry. His appetite left him. You must eat with me. 
he insisted, pushing the bowl toward his sister. With a frightened look toward the grandmother, the girl broke off a crust of bread and dipped it into the bowl. He saw the blue veins through the delicate flesh of her hand and wrist was fragile as a bird's claw. Where did they get food anyway? He tried to think how to ask. It is good bread, he said. Do you grow the grain? It is the pauper share, his grandmother answered shortly. He wished she had not asked. He hated the picture of his grandmother following after the reapers in the field, scrambling after the sheaves they dropped, which had by law be left for paupers to gather. After the meal was cleared away, they sat in silence. His grandmother did not ask any questions. Did she really care that he had come? She seemed too wary to care about anything. Her chin had settled into the folds of her mantle and she drifted in and out of an uneasy sleep. He supposed she must still work in the fields of Ketza, the plant from which the village took its name. Stooping over all day, she sowed and weeded and when the blue flowers had dropped, she beat off the seeds covering with a staff and gathered the tiny seeds so hot to the tongue, which were marketed as a seasoning for food. He looked about him. The clay platform, which had once divided the rooms into le two levels, had crumbled so that it was no more a shelf, that it was no more than a shelf, scarcely wide enough for sleeping. A hollow scooped out of the earthen floor held the cold ashes of an old fire. The only furniture was a battered wooden chest in the loom at which Leah had sat. As darkness fell, there was a soft thudding sound against the door. His grandmother roused herself and let in a small black goat. The little creature went straight to Leah, who reached out both arms toward it. The goat nuzzled against her and settled down to sleep with its square chin in the girl's lap. She sat fondling it, twining the black hairs of its beard around her fingers, talking to it in a soft murmur, like the sound of doves on the roof. Daniel watched them. His uneasiness lulled for a moment. She looks like our mother, he thought. Then he caught the words the soft voice was saying. You mustn't be afraid of him. He is our brother Daniel come home. When he milks you, you must be good and stand still. See how big and strong he is? He will take care of us and keep us safe. Suddenly he was afraid again. He looked away, trying to shut out the sight of her with her golden hair shining in the lamplight, trying to shut out the sound of that murmuring voice. Everything he cared about and worked for was threatened by that small helpless figure. His arms and legs were cramped. The airless little house seemed to hold all the heat of the day. <clears throat> the sputtering oil in the lamp filled the room with a rancid odor. His head was heavy and he thought with longing of the evening and he thought with longing of the evening breeze that would be moving among the branches above the cave. With relief he watched his grandmother lift down mats from a niche in the wall. I have ready I, ha I have made ready your old splate place on the roof, she said. He took the worn roll of matting, bade her good night, let himself out the door, and climbed a tottering ladder up the outside wall to the flat rooftop. It was a little cooler up here. Heat lay over the town like a smothering blanket. He sat for a time, hugging his knees and looking about him. Why did I come here, he thought. Already he yearned to be away from this place. Hunger gnawed at him. Up on the mountain, the men would be still sitting about the fire, their stomachs satisfied with stolen mutton and grape wine and joking and telling boastful stories. Later, they would wrap their cloaks about them and sleep with their lungs full of clean mountain air and the stars would come down brilliant close enough to touch. He wondered if Jockton had made sure that Samson had enough to eat. He wondered how long the man had waited at the top of the trail. Suddenly, he flung himself on his face and buried his head in his arms and could have wept for homesickness. That is the end of chapter three of The Bronze Bow.